Good morning, everybody. I'm Sebastian Ale from Safe Cluster. I'm very happy to host this webinar today. Um, there are some good news and other news. Um, the good news is that uh, there are about uh, 280 people, or no, more than 380 people registered for this webinar, which is awesome. Uh, that's good news. So the bad news is that uh, because of that, uh, there is no option for you to open your camera or your microphone. Uh, sorry for that. The good news is that wherever you are and whatever you are doing, nobody can see you on the screen. Um, obviously, there is an option for you to ask questions, and I invite you to do that through the chat window. Uh, this is a small window on the right of your screen. You can enlarge that as you wish. Um, probably you cannot see the question of all the attendees, but no worries, we'll see that, and our moderator will ask a question to the speakers uh, today, or if we cannot address everything after this webinar. Um, last news, uh, this webinar will last uh, about two hours. I don't know if it's a good or bad news, but the good news is that we will do a short break uh, right in the middle, a five minute break for a coffee. Um, thanks very much everybody for being there. That's a big community. And uh, now uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce Olga Fibonova from University Catholic of Louvain, uh, who will start introducing this webinar. Enjoy. Yeah. Uh, good morning, dear guests. Um, can you? I hope you can hear me and you can see me. Uh, so uh, it is my honor to introduce the topic of our today's webinar on just-in-time training. Um, we are uh, five networks of practitioners funded by uh, the European Commission who are hosting and organizing this webinar. Uh, namely, we are DareNet, Inotis, Firing, Medea, No Fear networks of practitioners. Initially, uh, just to date back a little bit in the history, we planned to organize a joint workshop at the uh, Interschutz Fair in Hanover in Germany. But due to the crisis, uh, all large events were canceled. Interschutz was canceled as well and it is postponed to next year. So uh, still we decided to organize uh, jointly a virtual event uh, on the topic which is relevant for all our networks of practitioners. And I believe we believe for all our guests. And this topic is uh, emergency training of first responders just in time for the crisis response. Basically, uh, in, during the crisis situation, there is no time for normal, long training. So, and then it is important to deliver this just-in-time training, uh, meaning the right material in the right educational modality to the learner at the right time, at the right location, and exactly in the needed amount. And it corresponds to the golden educational rules and values, meaning to deliver the greatest amount of educational content in the shortest amount of time. Uh, we need to remember that, of course, just-in-time training is never generic. It is always specific to a particular crisis or incident at hand. It is delivered um, usually to uh, first responders to learn some new task or new procedures or use of equipment or safety and security in the conditions uh, according to the uh, specific type and scale of the crisis uh, or incident. Of course, just-in-time training cannot replace normal training. It is delivered uh, as a complement. Uh, very not always, but very often, uh, first responders of one discipline are trained for new skills in another discipline in order to compensate for uh, lack of for shortage of experts uh, relevant uh, in the relevant field uh, during the crisis response. Uh, and then uh, it is inter, uh, inter uh, disciplinary education, interprofessional education. And then 
we believe that this is the combination of the regular training and additional knowledge acquired in just-in-time training that really amplifies the result. I am sure that all members of our five networks of practitioners and all invited guests, all of you, have plenty of examples of such just-in-time training uh, from your practices. On our side, uh, we also have some, and I would like to share a couple of quick examples. The first one comes from uh, our lab, where I'm working, Center for Applied Molecular Technologies, uh, Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. Uh, in cooperation with uh, Belgian civil protection, uh, we delivered uh, training to lab staff uh, and to uh, external volunteers, uh, uh, external experts, for uh, collecting and analyzing COVID-19 samples uh, using the laboratory materials and equipment. And now our mobile laboratory is uh, deployed for a humanitarian mission uh, in Italy, in the Piemonte region. This mission is led by Professor Jean-Luc Gallet. This mission uh, is meant for uh, two months. Uh, and this mission supports uh, the local civil protection and local hospital in Piemonte region. Uh, another example comes from fire and rescue service of Sena Marne in France, uh, where firefighters were trained for uh, uh, deployment in field structures to support hospitals for deployment of uh, uh, in uh, retirement homes. Uh, and here again, we have to remember that this additional training for the for the uh, COVID-19 crisis was uh, possible. Uh, quickly and efficiently due to already previous knowledge and very substantial training of uh, firefighters uh, of dealing with uh, infectious diseases and their general CBRN culture. Uh, they, for example, already knew uh, the core principles of contamination management and things like that. So that's why they adapted very quickly and they were able to learn very quickly. And uh, one more example, interesting example of new learners. Uh, just in time, uh, were that uh, St. Martin firefighters train uh, five shepherd dogs to sniff COVID-19. Uh, these dogs uh, have already experience in identifying cattle uh, sick with other diseases, and now they are trained to smell uh, coronavirus. So uh, they are trained on their hospital samples uh, from uh, COVID-19 positive patients. Uh, these samples are put in containers and there are already some positive results, so uh, dogs uh, are able to identify the right samples uh, with COVID-19 and the right containers. Of course, more tests are needed to, um, uh, to avoid false negative results. Um, so, uh, during today, you will hear uh, in detail uh, more detailed presentations about more examples of just-in-time training in the um, COVID-19 pandemics from No Fear Project, uh, for flood response from DareNet Project, and from uh, in CBRN uh, field, online learning from Inotis Project. Here are the contexts of our five projects, generic context, contexts, and uh, always you are welcome to uh, contact us at any time for discussion. We are always happy to uh, to receive new members, new stakeholders, and uh, we are always uh, very enthusiastic for, for this. Uh, now we would like to proceed with presenting you our uh, projects. And I invite Dearnet to, uh, to start. Yes, thanks, Olga. So this is uh, Chris Illing. I'm with the THW in Germany, and we are coordinating the DareNet project, which is uh, uh, not a typical um, research and development project, as you probably know. Uh, it's a coordination support action, same for all the others. Um, it's a network project. We try to gather the knowledge from uh, various stakeholders in the field of uh, flood protection, flood management, from the Danube River region. Um, so we have formed a consortium of um, 15 partners representing 11 countries. Um, yeah, we're setting up uh, this, this large community and exchange on 
um, practitioner needs, um, search for innovation opportunities and formulate that and a roadmap, which hopefully will then be picked up by decision makers and um, will guide industry also to um, new and promising solutions. And obviously, um, while dealing with floods in the past has always involved some um, volunteer, uh, spontaneous volunteer involvement. And this requires a lot of then just in time training because you never know who will show up and what they will do. And we will have a speaker presenting his experience in that field later on. Thanks. And uh, I will hand over to the next. Thanks, Christian. Um, so far, um, Sebastian, I again, so the coordinator of this firing project. Um, as Christian already said, uh, our project have, uh, are project of networks, and our focus is in firing is the uh, fire and rescue community in Europe. The objective is definitely to strengthen the, the, the fire and rescue uh, capability uh, uh, in, in research and innovation in, in Europe with a bottom-up approach, uh, just to express correctly the, the needs of the practitioners. We work with five thematic working groups. Uh, the first one is about search, rescue and emergency medical services. The second thematic working group is on structural fires. The third one is on uh, landscape fires. The fourth on the overall natural hazards. And the fifth one with CBRE events. And uh, you can find everything uh, on uh, www.fireinn.eu uh, uh, with this nice platform with uh, hundreds of uh, practitioners engaged there. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. My name is Monica and I'm here as I am part of the coordinators team of the No Fear project. The No Fear project is a network of practitioners that brings together practitioners, suppliers, policymakers and researchers in the field of uh, emergency medicine. Uh, the aim of this uh, project is to enhance the collaboration and the cooperation uh, among different sectors, as I said, uh, we put together suppliers and practitioners, policymakers and researchers. And in this way to overcome or at least try to overcome the fragmentation that exists in the field of emergency medicine and um, try to improve the response of the emergency medical system to the new threats. Uh, this year for our project was a big deal because uh, the biggest health threat came uh, to us and as a project we had a, a huge role in trying our best to uh, in some way uh, enhance, amplify the collaboration within the European landscape uh, to the response to the COVID-19. One of the examples is the work we did in the training um, that will be um, well explained later by my colleague here. Thank you and see you later. And now... Good, good morning. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, in notice now. Okay. Uh, me again with a presentation of uh, Inotis project, which is the net European network of uh, CBRN training centers. Uh, and uh, our um, objectives uh, in this project are multifold. Uh, first, we uh, decided to find and map all the existing training centers in the European Union. Currently, we identified uh, 202 training centers and uh, 47 of training centers joined our network. And these uh, training centers who joined the network, they are mainly primarily from the European Union, but a few of them come from outside European Union. If you uh, go to our website and look in the catalog, you will find, you will discover uh, three training centers outside European Union. That is due to our collaboration with DigiDevco. Uh, DigiDevco also has an objective to map 
uh, training capacities, but outside European Union, and they decided they offered us to uh, unite the efforts and to use our questionnaire, our methodology in order to approach training centers. So, okay, we have the collaboration with them, and uh, uh, tra uh, training centers from outside European Union can also see and uh, have access to European Union training centers. Uh, then our uh, main uh, networking mechanism is organization of multiple joint activities, meaning field exercises, tabletops, serious gaming and simulations throughout the project. And all of these exercises are not organized specifically by the project, but they are hosted by member training centers uh, who, who open their normal annual exercises and invite other stakeholders, uh, current R&D projects to uh, our exercises. We have in our consortium uh, seven civilian training centers and three military training centers from eight countries. And we uh, work with many research and development projects uh, who actually participate in our exercises. There are some observers, but some actual participants, for example, terrific project, uh, current Siberian project from uh, Siberian cluster part B. And another one, it is a current Siberian project proactive. Um, so the major distinguishing points of a notice is this multidisciplinary exercises, what we do, uh, civil military cooperation, which is very relevant in Siberian field, and cross-border exercises. You can see uh, pictures from a couple of examples, uh, an exercise in uh, France and uh, German-Polish exercise in Germany and Tokyo. So you are very welcome to uh, visit the website and get more information about our network of practitioners. Next one. Good morning from me. A uh, warm welcome on behalf of the Medea Network of Practitioners. Medea is a regional and practical, it's a regional network of practitioners and from made from members from the Mediterranean and Black Sea region. We are a multidisciplinary network of security organizations and we have a variety of expertise coming from various uh, organizations like police forces, such as rescue team and humanitarian workers. A variety of first responders with having one thing in common. The organizations are based in the Mediterranean and Black Sea region. This is why we're using the community of practice model where we bring together practitioners with focus areas on migration and asylum seeking challenges. That means organizations varying from border guards, police officers, personnel from various governmental authorities, NGOs to name but a few. Likewise, we have practitioners and stakeholders from national and EU organizations supporting operations at EU borders. Also, we have to mention the community of practitioners. We are challenged to respond to cross-border crime, return of foreign fighters, and new form of terrorism. Last but not least, we have a community of first responders who have to deal with the consequences of natural disasters, technological accidents, and quite often a combination of them. So, the objective is to join forces with practitioners from other networks, like we're doing this this, this time, and a part of defining and prioritizing common capability gaps, we're also looking to outreach solutions providers and engage with them into a fruitful dialogue that will lead to more secure societies. That's it for me, and I hope you find this webinar applicable and interesting. Thank you. Monica here again. I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Luca Ragazzoni. Luca is the scientific coordinator of CRIMEDIM Research Center in Emergency and Disaster Medicine. Uh, CRIMEDIM is a research center based in Italy with projects worldwide, both on research and operations in the field of disaster medicine and humanitarian aid. Uh, Luca has more than 15 years of experience in designing and delivering 
training both for professionals and for uh, the academia uh, field. Uh, during the Ebola outbreak, uh, Luca had the opportunity to be a training manager for a very big project run by Save the Children, where more than 1,000 healthcare professionals were training, trained using uh, innovative technologies. And this gave him the opportunity to be in some way ready uh, to take care of the training uh, of the healthcare personnel in our hospital in Novara during the COVID-19 crisis. I don't steal you more time. I leave the floor to Luca for his presentation. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me of, uh, for being here. And I would like to thank uh, the organizer for uh, inviting me. Um, I will give you a brief uh, explanation of what we have uh, done uh, in, uh, in Italy, in, uh, in the Novara Hospital, one, uh, the second largest hospital uh, in, in, the region, in the Piedmont region. And uh, I will also give an example on how to use uh, innovative solution for training uh, healthcare workers uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is uh, currently treating numerous health systems around the world, requiring an extraordinary international response to contain and control the virus. These are the numbers uh, from yesterday, and as you can see, we have more than 8 million uh, cases uh, uh, all over the world. This response includes effective education and training of uh, healthcare workers to attain uh, several operational level public health skills. Normally, these skills are uh, beyond the experience and knowledge base of uh, most practitioners not familiar with the public health emergencies arising from uh, uh, infectious disease uh, outbreak. As already said, Italy has been one of the most affected countries where hospitals were struggling uh, to deal with the surge of patients affected by COVID-19. Patients were being treated in hospital corridors, hospital departments uh, have been converted to treat only COVID-19 uh, patient. Many physicians and nurses were working outside of their field of expertise, feel uneasy managing and treating a highly transmissible uh, infection for which there is no specific therapy and no vaccine. Moreover, the risk of secondary infection among healthcare workers is extremely high. In such context, we believe that implementation of just-in-time training intervention focused on uh, population-based medicine and management skills was of paramount importance to equip health workers with basic competencies to proficiently and safely work in any hospital and pre-hospital services during uh, this current pandemic. Just-in-time training is a well-established concept as I already said at the beginning, mainly among disaster and uh, humanitarian response responder, and is intended to rapidly address specific information, tasks, skills, and knowledge just before the deployment to a disaster-stricken area, and also to, pro uh, to prepare provider for the deployment experience and to maximize the effectiveness of disaster response. The Novara Hospital, as I said, is the second largest third level referral hospital of the Piedmont region, one of the most affected regions in the Northwest Italy. So while COVID-19 was rapidly spreading in the region, the activation of the hospital contingency plan for massive influx of uh, patients progressively established the transformation of hospital wards and sometimes also asile into court intensive and non-intensive uh, uh, care units for COVID-19 positive patients. 
At the peak of the admission, the emergency department and the ICU expanded uh, their operational uh, staff, stuff, and structure to the main aspect of surge capacity. And more than 200 COVID-19 beds were made available, and more than 300 healthcare workers were asked to change their roles and tasks to equip these newly opened hospital units. In this scenario, we recognize that a COVID-19 just-in-time training was essential for the entire hospital to meet the needs of rapidly attaining competencies that were beyond the experience of most of them. Furthermore, we strongly believe that the unexpected magnitude of this crisis generated uh, a, a requirement that, uh, not, that would require not only the attainment of uh, infection prevention and control measure and public health skills, that of course are the core of uh, uh, outbreak and, and population-based management, but also the awareness of disaster medicine principle, such as uh, surge capacity and uh, scarce resource allocation, triage, and how to deal with ethical dilemmas of rationing uh, medical uh, care. So therefore we design the COVID-19 just-in-time training to provide uh, the entire hospital uh, healthcare work, uh, workforce with a common background, competencies and proper aptitude needed to proficiently and safely work inside the hospital during the COVID-19 pandemic, understand the working principle and the standard operating procedure in place in the hospital, accurately apply and remove the personal protective equipment, as you can see in, uh, in this picture. And as I said, understand the principle of disaster medicine and public health emergencies applied to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In this table, uh, uh, you can see the curriculum framework of our uh, just-in-time training implemented in the hospital. At the, at the end of the training, the participant met the needs of hospital seeking uh, of qualified hospital-based healthcare personnel with basic uh, IPC competencies and awareness of uh, disaster medicine ready to respond to the COVID-19. The utmost learning objective was to practically improve the public health uh, management component and awareness and uh, technical and attitudinal performances rather than uh, delivering the mere knowledge. So we run the training uh, every afternoon for three weeks uh, from March 9, uh, and we train around two, 300 hospital staff. The training lasts uh, four hours. So as you can see, it's very short and in just in time. And uh, every training session was opened for a maximum of uh, 30 uh, healthcare workers, hosted in a main uh, hospital conference hall with around 100 seats to ensure uh, uh, social distancing. So given the strong uh, traditional uh, public health measure and, uh, in place as of the lockdown, e-learning has been the favorite uh, uh, training methodology worldwide. However, taking uh, the proper precaution as the social distancing and safety measure, we decide to use a classroom-based approach to ensure that participants could really approach and practice the application of uh, PPE, donning and doffing, and especially to discuss any possible doubts directly with us. So to understand the issue within uh, uh, the hospital and to solve it. However, an e-learning session was made available by everyone in the uh, e-learning platform. So on uh, June uh, 15, so after four months uh, since uh, the beginning of the outbreak in Italy, more than 20,000 Italian healthcare workers contracted COVID-19, and unfortunately, more than 160 have died. 
So this number reinforced once again how important was the implementation of the training to address, to address competencies that we knew were beyond the experience of most of our colleagues. Another lesson learned is that the idea to address disaster medicine and population-based management concept was also crucial, taking into consideration that the rapid in spread and insurgence of COVID-19 pushed to the limit the hospital contingency plan, generating a crisis management condition that collapses all major public health protection and for the majority of the healthcare workers in the hospital, this was their first experience in responding to a large scale public health emergency or a disaster. Regrettably, public health emergency and disaster medicine or global health, in, in, uh, most of them are never studied in the medical school. So our intention is that the current pandemic should stimulate the academic community to consider introducing at least some basic disaster medicine and global health teaching in the medical and uh, nursing school. Then we use our experience in, uh, in uh, developing uh, virtual reality training uh, to train healthcare workers around the world together with uh, uh, the NGO uh, UK Met. So our previous experience during the response to the uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014-15 uh, in the West Africa, in, at that time we applied uh, an innovative just-in-time training uh, methodology using virtual reality simulation. At that time we demonstrate that virtual reality is effective to increase uh, staff safety before taking the risk on working uh, within an Ebola treatment center. Unfortunately, the rapid uh, insurgence of and spread of COVID-19 in, in, in other Italy implied that uh, the urgency to train the hospital staff in a matter of days, impending us to devote time in computer programming to, de to develop the virtual reality scenario. But as I said, now we have uh, scenario and now we are uh, using and disseminating the online virtual reality simulation uh, all over the world, especially in uh, low resource sector. So why virtual reality? Virtual reality simulate highly specialized real world environment. Training can be done remotely, and I, I will show you lately, ensuring access to a high number of staff. Safe training, of course, for a high risk scenario as Ebola and the COVID-19. Increased knowledge retention because you can uh, repeat uh, the scenario uh, more time. Reduce the cost and travel and, uh, and for during the, the, the travel restriction. And uh, you can use uh, virtual reality with other type of simulation, developing uh, hybrid scenarios. And uh, since it's very flexible, you can be adaptable to different contexts. In this case, during the COVID-19, uh, we worked together again with uh, uh, the WHO, the UK uh, MET, to create a virtual reality scenario that uh, exposed humanitarian workers in understanding uh, a community center layout, a COVID-19 community center layout. As you know, at this moment, uh, uh, it's very important to create uh, a community center in, uh, in, uh, in countries where there is no capacity to admit and treat patients. And basically, using uh, uh, delay the 2D layout, we develop a scenario. And from this video, you can see how the humanitarian workers and uh, all the healthcare professional and all the professionals that are working within a new community health center can understand the working principles and layout working within the, the center itself. This is uh, the entrance uh, of uh, uh, the community center layout. And as you can see from, uh, from this uh, uh, video, 
Uh, it's very important during the, the triage to use uh, plexiglass or uh, a screen uh, to avoid the contact with suspected cases. And then, of course, we created in a virtual reality scenario the entire community center, also where the patients are, uh, are really treated. And from this video, uh, you can see how can you, the trainee and attendee can walk in and again understand the standard operating procedure and the working principle and the safety measure within uh, uh, the community center. So I, this is what I wanted to, to say and thank you very much again for uh, uh, the invitation and these are my uh, email address if anyone can contact me later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca, for your interesting presentation. I think it was very valuable to hear the experience of someone who found himself in, in one of the worst hidden areas in, in the world, at least in the, in the very first uh, uh, weeks. So we already have some questions and we have now 15 minutes to answer to all your curiosities. Feel free to post them on the uh, question box. box. Uh, we have already Damien from Switzerland asking Luca, how did you form all the healthcare workers that needed to change units? For example, pediatric nurse to work in ICU? Because here in Switzerland, nurses had only one day of supervision to learn ventilation basis, etc. Luca, can you? Give an answer to Damien. Yeah, so I would like to uh, specify that. So the, the just-in-time training that we implemented was not for training or equipping healthcare workers to change the role, but was a very short, again, four hours course to equip them with basic principle of uh, infection prevention and control measure. Again, disaster medicine concept and uh, uh, standard operating procedure policy within the hospital. Yes, of course, when the, 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 the healthcare workers that uh, uh, shift from uh, uh, one department to another, uh, what we did, we suggested, and uh, for example, in the ICU, we did it. So we created a, a mentorship process where we flanked highly experienced uh, ICU staff with uh, uh, no experience, uh, one for a 10 days apprenticeship process. And uh, uh, of course, after these four hours, and we added uh, uh, the uh, apprenticeship uh, uh, process while uh, uh, working uh, in uh, um, daily. Thank you, Luca. Damien, I hope you are satisfied with this answer. Uh, then we have Anne asking if the virtual reality training is available in several languages. Uh, so there is no languages. Uh, so basically is uh, uh, we created the scenario and we created different uh, uh, videos uh, to expose uh, health professional in understanding the, uh, the layout. Uh, we use the software that are available uh, on market. We, we don't own the software. Basically, we use a software already available and we use our experience uh, in uh, developing training uh, using virtual reality for this specific uh, uh, task. Uh, our scenario is, is totally available. If you need it, I can, I can share with all of you that are uh, attending now the, the um, the scenario, but my suggestion is that uh, uh, should be adaptable to uh, to the needs, to what you want to achieve. So our intention was to expose uh, professional before the deployment in the area to understand uh, the uh, the layout of a new COVID-19 uh, community center. So because one of the most important uh, part for a new health professional entering a new uh, working place is to understand where there is the triage uh, area and how, uh, which kind of personal protective equipment I need to wear in that specific area 
and which are the measuring place. And again, so the, the, the virtual reality give us the opportunity to explain uh, how to move and where you have to uh, behave in, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. Great, thank you very much. We have a question from George from Romania. George is asking, how did the hospital workers react to the just-in-time training? And did they find it useful? Uh, so we have just published in, a, in one of the most important uh, journals for uh, academic uh, uh, research, uh, education and training research is the academic journal, uh, academic medicine, sorry. And uh, unfortunately, as we all explain also in the, in, uh, in the paper, we were not able to assess outcome or to evaluate uh, uh, the effectiveness or the satisfaction of uh, uh, the participant because we decide uh, from the beginning not to uh, add the workload uh, uh, to, the, to the participants. And because a lot of literature already say that uh, just-in-time training uh, is very effective. But yes, we have some uh, lesson learned, as I said. Uh, the training was really appreciated. The feeling that uh, we had while we were running the training that uh, the just-in-time training was highly appreciated because uh, uh, they solve a lot of doubts. And then the other issue is that most of the healthcare workers working in our hospital, again, were, they didn't never experienced a crisis like that and a disaster like that. So explaining our previous experience in Ebola, in Haiti, and our experience in disaster medicine was really important for them to understand, to, to sensitize uh, the healthcare workers of the importance to, to, to be available, to, 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 to increase the willingness to respond and also to um, to give them the confidence, the right confidence to, to respond. And then we, uh, they, most of them, uh, after the training, uh, were, were ready and the, the, the fear disappeared. This, in my opinion, was, was the key of, uh, uh, of the training. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of questions more. For Luca, uh, Solara is asking how many days after the COVID-19 cases started to appear in Italy, the training was conducted? We started right away. So we started the day after uh, we, we had uh, uh, the, the first cases, actually the, the, the same day. So we started uh, in the ICU and uh, in the uh, emergency department and uh, we started uh, in parallel uh, in, uh, with the creation of the standard operating procedure and the patient flow, okay? So we brought our experience from Ebola in the hospital and we created patient flows um, for uh, suspected uh, and not suspected cases and also patient flow for staff where to create a, a one-way entrance uh, uh, to the ICU and the emergency department to avoid contamination. So from there, we expanded, uh, after one week, we expanded this training to the whole uh, healthcare workers of the, uh, of the hospital, uh, moving uh, the, the, the training from uh, the ICU, a small room of the ICU, to the, as I said, in the uh, main hall of the hospital, uh, with a lot of seats, but only for 13 uh, uh, Health professional uh, uh, a day, so to maintain social distancing, and uh, so uh, we were able to to start right away, and uh, and we ran the training for uh, for three weeks uh, until uh, we haven't uh, um, uh, any attendees anymore. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, then we have. Mm, quite a good group of people asking about uh, something similar being organized in low resource countries. Uh, Mohammed, for example, is asking if it is possible to conduct such trainings to public health clients, for example, the Ministry of Health outside EU, 
and other attendees are asking if there is any plan to deliver similar trainings outside Italy in low resource countries in particular. Luca. Yes, so as a research center, as academic research center, we are working with uh, uh, many organizations, uh, international organizations as UN, WHO, uh, and also uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, now we are working mainly with uh, UK Met and uh, with uh, Kuwam. And uh, so we are supporting uh, them uh, for, uh, for this training. And this training, the, the virtual reality training, has been uh, used by uh, UK Med for all uh, their staff. And they, they, their staff, they are using the training in uh, countries for uh, uh, the local, uh, yes, Ministry of Health and uh, uh, local uh, healthcare workers. Uh, in, uh, in several countries. And with Kuam, we have a large program uh, in uh, uh, Sierra Leone. We are partnering with, uh, with Opto with Africa Kuam, and we, uh, we started a large program uh, uh, three years ago, and uh, with the objective to implement uh, uh, the emergency medical service, the ambulance service throughout uh, uh, the country, a national service, and uh, uh, before uh, uh, COVID arrived in, uh, in, in Sierra Leone, we trained all the paramedics and uh, drivers to manage COVID-19 patients outside the hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, if I have time, I would like to pose two more questions to Luca. Uh, one is concerning the uh, virtual reality scenario. Ivana is asking uh, if there is no language interaction, uh, did you identify needs for incorporating uh, language interaction in the tool at a certain point? Yes, of course. So, uh, so what we did, uh, for example, during the, uh, the Ebola, uh, so the, we, uh, we used the virtual reality scenario in count in Sierra Leone. And at that time, uh, uh, we train the trainers. We train local trainers in using the, uh, the, the, the tool and the, the scenario to train uh, the others. So uh, my, my suggestion is, uh, is, 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 uh, is using the, the virtual reality at your needs, OK? And not having a, a, a generic uh, virtual reality scenario. Of course, we can do that, but uh, it should be uh, in English. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's difficult to, to, tra to, to translate uh, uh, the voiceover uh, on, on, the, on the virtual reality in many languages. Uh, I would suggest to, to use the scenario and adapt the scenario, uh, uh, embedding your uh, voiceover or your slides uh, in, uh, in what you need. Okay, thank you. And a few people, uh, as per the face-to-face uh, -face experiences, they asked if you received any feedback from the virtual reality uh, training and how was the feedback of the users in this? Okay, for the COVID-19, uh, we, we have been using only by a distance, so we are uh, um, scheduling uh, uh, online training uh, for UK Med uh, staff uh, every week and we, we, we normally have uh, 20 30 uh, participants every week and uh, and uh, they, uh, they they appreciate the fact that they now understand before the deployment how a new covid-19 uh, uh, community center works because it's different uh, seeing the, 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 the COVID-19 community center layout in a 2D map rather than uh, seeing uh, in a 3D in a virtual reality and walking. So again, for health professional, the most important part is to, to feel comfortable, to understand where there is the risk and how to protect themselves from the risk. 
Great, this is clear. I am afraid we finished our available time for question and answers. Feel free to reach Luca at this address if you have any other um, questions about this. And I leave now the floor to Sebastian. Thanks very much, uh, Monica, and thanks very much, Luca, for this brilliant uh, presentation and discussion. Um, now it's time before to hear and see our next speakers for a few minutes breaks. So just for five minutes, very maximum, to have a, a, a coffee. Uh, thanks, everybody, and, and be back in five minutes.
Okay, I guess the coffee is good or tea maybe. Um, now it's time to move to our second very exciting presentation. And uh, may I invite uh, Christian to introduce our next speaker, thanks. Yes, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so I'm glad to introduce to you um, Joel Kellerman, who is the uh, current head of the EUSDR Priority Area 5 Disaster Management Working Group, which is a regional um, um, policy body. Um, but his background is pretty strong in firefighting since he has been in that profession for many years. Prior, he was a trained mathematician. Um, since 2020, Stroll is head of this uh, disaster management working group for the European Union strategy for the, the NOOP region um, in the priority uh, area five on environmental risk. Further, Joel is uh, the vice president of the Hungarian Firefighters Association since 2008 and also the president of the local Budapest uh, Firefighters Association since 2012. Additionally, he is a member, a board member of the Fire Safety Advisory Board uh, within the Ministry of Interior in Hungary since 2016. And very interesting to us and pretty much, um, yeah, uh, joining with, with the topic of this, this day's uh, webinar. He's also the current uh, project coordinator of the Interreg project joint development of the voluntary emergency response and disaster management capacity in the eligible border, border area. So I'm glad to hand over to you, Joel. Um, looking forward to your talk. It's nice to see you, Christian, uh, live, uh, if not in person. And uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to add that uh, our hearts and minds go out to uh, the Italian medical staff for what they've been doing in the last three to four months, uh, which is enormous. Uh, and uh, we will connect uh, in my presentation, we might be able to connect to one part uh, in just in time training to the previous presenter. Um, I have started sharing my screen. Uh, I don't know if you uh, see it properly. That's the opening screen. Darnet has already presented uh, what they wish to. Lessons learned from past and recent disaster incidents. This is uh, my topic uh, with a special request to focus on the floods, uh, which we had quite many. And the latest uh, and the largest was uh, the Danube flood in 2013. Uh, where the Danube at Budapest peaked uh, at its ever highest, uh, almost uh, nine meters. This is not really uh, much telling to anyone other than those living in Budapest, but if you see uh, that's uh, the lower bank, uh, parliament in the background, and even the upper bank had to be uh, protected uh, at some point. What uh, uh, concerns this training issue here is how can we engage volunteers uh, uh, in uh, major scale incidents, in this case floods. The concept of uh, engaging uh, volunteers, and uh, we have to make a few distinctions here, uh, but before going into that, the training that has to be given to anyone showing up on the scene uh, has to be clarified in advance and this would also concern in our uh, mind uh, our minds we would also train uh, media workers as well uh, we had initiatives and we have compiled materials for them this has not gone into operation yet, but let's hope it will someday. So the idea is to provide trained first responders and engage third parties with, and the keyword situation specific and relevant safety and security guidelines on the spot or preferably in advance. Uh, 
And first, I would like to clarify the target groups. Uh, trained first responders uh, are two categories to me. One is carrier. In uh, many, many, many documents and uh, pieces of legislation, uh, they call them professional first responders. And I would like to make a very clear distinction here. And this is the US uh, term carrier, meaning those who are paid for their work. Uh, as opposed to volunteers who are not, but hopefully they live up to and work according to the same standards of their profession or their uh, vocation. So uh, this is uh, important uh, because if you say professional and volunteer, then volunteers sound like amateurs, which they are definitely not. Uh, engaged third parties are those who first responders, uh, uh, even at uh, uh, the scene of a road accident, can be engaged to help if you need their uh, manpower or even their tools or vehicles, whatever they have. Uh, engaged third parties could be carrier practitioners, uh, public utilities, uh, industrial or technological foremen in uh, different uh, facilities. And as in the case of a, a major flood event, it's spontaneous volunteers. And they all have to be given this, uh, the trained first responders usually are given a briefing, an uh, orientation. Engaged third parties need a bit more. Uh, how about in advance and on the spot? It's preferable to receive uh, information uh, before going to uh, uh, the scene of an incident uh, or accident uh, as opposed to on the spot. So uh, even with uh, the Danube flood, we try to give information to spontaneous volunteers before they arrived uh, to their place of uh, engagement. Uh, the in advance part could be done uh, uh, through individual learning, uh, uh, any documents handed out, but preferably some uh, sort of uh, internet uh, web-based or even mobile application-based uh, pieces of knowledge. On the spot is uh, pretty much the last stage uh, where just-in-time training uh, or any information could be given to those entering uh, either the work zone or in a more dangerous situations, it's the danger zone. Uh, on this uh, small picture, you see uh, the bottom right corner, uh, big, uh, I think it was an A, three or A2 size poster with uh, many, many information concerning spontaneous and trained volunteers. Uh, I have a question mark here with the verification. Uh, I was going to ask uh, that from Luca, but I figured I, I can touch up on this in a more general fashion, that uh, it's nice to give people information and knowledge, and we always assume that, okay, they paid attention, or read what they were supposed to, did what they were supposed to, and they know all that is written or was given in any other form. How do we know that? Uh, we just take this for granted. Uh, that's why I would prefer uh, methods of uh, e-learning or at least something uh, technologically based, uh, which could be a mobile phone, where we can have at least a few questions, which uh, especially spontaneous volunteers and uh, engaged third parties uh, give a feedback on what they understood from what we were trying to tell them. Um, the in advance part here, um, at the Danube flood uh, in uh, the capital in Budapest, uh, the disaster management director had opened a, a surface and that is, uh, uh, seen at the bottom left corner, uh, a registration form where any spontaneous volunteer who wished to come and help did not just show up on the scene, uh, uh, uninvited, quote unquote, uh, but they had to register for two hour shifts. So uh, this way the workforce, uh, the volunteer, spontaneous volunteer workforce could uh, be uh, distributed evenly, another mathematical term, uh, and uh, uh, they could be given some uh, information in advance. Uh, hopefully in the future this uh, might be 
uh, and this is the Interreg uh, uh, project uh, which uh, Christian has mentioned that uh, we are uh, developing a mobile application for uh, trained uh, first responders, especially volunteers in the Carpathian Basin, scalable up to 50,000 volunteers, where a mobile app, uh, mobile app can notify those who are part of this uh, pool, and they can uh, re register for uh, specific events, which could be incidents, could be trainings, uh, training courses, uh, could be social events and uh, anything else, even uh, uh, summer camps, uh, at the quick click of a button. Uh, on the right hand side you see this uh, 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 22 points of uh, what to do uh, in case of a flood, uh, the rules of working, this is what it says at the top, uh, even the workloads which is not too uh, how would I put it, not really equal opportunities because uh, it says that uh, male volunteers can lift uh, weight uh, loads of up to 20 kilograms whereas uh, uh, female volunteers could not do that but that is uh, really not uh, lifelike. Uh, in the future uh, it would be nice to have uh, First of all, we try to focus on the Carpathian Basin, the Danube region, but hopefully at the European level, and not just EU level, but European level, we could have uh, standardized uh, training materials for a carrier and volunteer trained uh, uh, professionals, trained uh, first responders, uh, and we could have just in time training modules uh, which are uh, incident uh, or event specific and those could be shared with spontaneous volunteers and uh, third parties in general. Uh, and the disaster management working group uh, is uh, aiming to be a platform for this uh, uh, knowledge sharing uh, and of course uh, we would like to identify good practices in uh, the various uh, European countries and not uh, standardizing uh, everything but uh, focusing on recommending, harmonizing these practices and uh, uh, procedures and protocols. Uh, on the right hand side you already see this mobile app which is an event manager. Uh, it's downloadable uh, from, uh, uh, how would I say, neutrally. Uh, the various uh, mobile uh, the applications, uh, mobile platforms. Uh, this is a closed uh, system so it's not open for anybody but uh, we uh, authorize registrations to this uh, mobile app, this event manager, uh, where uh, the trained volunteers will be notified of various events and we also aim, which is very important, to keep a record of their competences and skills which I would uh, regard as a higher level of knowledge as opposed to competences, uh, skills which can be readily applied if needed. Uh, by this I mean um, the uh, driver's licenses for different categories uh, even uh, uh, with uh, vehicles with uh, sirens or uh, the medical examinations when they expire so we would see uh, on this platform right away who can be uh, uh, engaged or deployed to a major incident. Uh, we could see if they have special uh, equipment training uh, with examinations and uh, I would say valid medical examinations which are in Hungary are for uh, two years or three depending on the age group. Uh, for chainsaws, uh, high capacity farms, uh, uh, electric poles, uh, uh, transformers, uh, spreader cutters, whatever. So this is what we are aiming at. Uh, I don't know if I'm within my time limit. Yes, it seems. Uh, just uh, Another picture, and this is the verification bit. Uh, we uh, do some work for uh, a big uh, electricity 
provider and uh, by me uh, big i mean it's a national 140 uh, service providers and every time we enter a facility we have to sign um, different sheets one of them is a work safety log where we attest that we understood the just-in-time training the on-the-spot training for that particular facility where we can go and where we should not go uh, this is important uh, in uh, how would i phrase uh, in uh, unwelcome events when something goes wrong uh, usually uh, the person or the people responsible uh, will be held accounted uh, and if there is a signature that they were given instructions on what to do and what not, uh, they, this uh, responsibility might be narrowed down. Uh, for example, as engaged third parties, a few years ago we had to cut uh, out some dangerous trees near a children's railway where we had to engage uh, the operators of the railway uh, they came with a locomotive, uh, they brought their own equipment, we had to work together. Everybody was told uh, what uh, they could do on the scene, how to pay attention to one another, who is in charge and who has to be uh, looked at, at all the time. And uh, I see that there's something wrong with my webcam, but I don't know how that happened. It's green on my control panel uh, so everybody was given instructions for working together and they each had to each and everyone had to sign that they understood what's going to happen this narrows down the responsibility of the person in charge on the scene on the spot uh, it will not eliminate this totally but it helps to a certain extent and uh, there is a, i mentioned this to christian when we were preparing for this presentation that, for example, in uh, the Hungarian nuclear power plant, uh, this work safety log works uh, electronically. Um, you have a touch screen and 10 questions are asked. If you just make one or two mistakes, I think you are allowed to enter. One of this means for daily, uh, not the employees, but those contractors, subcontractors coming in to uh, perform some work. And if they fail more than that, they cannot enter the facility so that's pretty much verification um, and this is something we have to keep in mind how we can verify uh, normal uh, forms of training or e-learning uh, whether they acquired what they what we wanted them to acquire and especially in case of just-in-time training how do we uh, follow up on uh, whether uh, everybody understood what we were trying to get through Thank you for your attention. Um, I'm open for questions. Thank you, John. Um, and indeed, we got some questions. Um, let me start with one. So there's one. Uh, there's, there's one, one um, I would call it general comment on um, the verification and batching and, and controlling the admission um, of volunteers to the scene um, to stay on top of the situation and uh, um, your, uh, what, what's your, um, obviously your opinion on that, but that goes kind of hand in hand with um, a question if uh, whether paramedics trained in other countries would be eligible for spontaneous volunteers. I think uh, that highly depends on the local uh, law situation or national law situation, but I would like to hand over to you if you have any of that experiences, like uh, experts from, from other countries trying to bring think, in. Uh, their... uh, for example, with the Danube flood, and uh, just recently we had uh, big storms uh, last year, uh, we have a uh, uh, fellow uh, firefighters volunteer and carry firefighters uh, coming to help in case of bigger incidents. Uh, generally, what happens, how can you engage uh, somebody from uh, elsewhere? Obviously, there is the uh, uh, EU civil protection mechanism, but that is uh, uh, strictly controlled by state uh, agencies. But 
uh, volunteer organizations, for example, our Firefighter Association can invite fellow Firefighter Association members. Uh, and the way this works is with any incident, there must be a carrier, firefighter, a carrier, a civil protection specialist on the scene, and everybody reports to this person. So do the volunteers, and they do not do that individually, but the chief or uh, the commander of the volunteer firefighters, a deputy commander uh, of the volunteer firefighter reports, and the volunteers report to their own uh, chief or deputy chief. Uh, when we invite or uh, receive help from outside the country, uh, they are as if they were our, our own volunteers within the Volunteer Fire Brigade. And this way the chain of command stays and uh, with the implications of uh, liability, responsibility, as I already mentioned before. So, for example, uh, an EMT coming from abroad will be considered as a volunteer. Um, not a, sp a spontaneous volunteer if he can prove his qualifications he will be qualified as a trained volunteer and we will be aware of his uh, uh, competencies and skills hopefully uh, we are working towards uh, uh, having uh, an id card which would be a smart card and uh, everybody could show it up on the scene uh, either that's a major incident or a minor one and the uh, uh, on-the-scene chief could uh, read that smart card and see whether that person is actually eligible to use a certain tool. Uh, because it did happen in the past uh, that somebody was using a tool he or she was not uh, trained to, and even if um, uh, he or she is trained to, uh, she or he might have a, an expired medical examination. Uh, until something goes wrong, this seems perfectly fine, but when the foot is the sham, as the Americans say, uh, this chain of responsibility will be unwinded. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that was answered. Then we have some some questions regarding the um, yeah technology technological questions uh, regarding the mobile app. Um, are you uh, considering to incorporate the verification function in the app? Um, and then what, what are you thinking of? This mobile app is uh, for trained volunteers. Uh, their training uh, is shifting towards uh, e-learning, distance learning formats as much as possible. As Luca mentioned, to save time and other resources, for example, save time of the instructors. Save, uh, save which costs money eventually and save fuel, save travel time whatsoever. So we try to, uh, we have uh, 40, 80, 120, 140, 200, 300, 600 hour courses. We try to narrow down these times at least uh, to 50% or even lower if possible by distance learning forms. Uh, at the end of each of these training courses, they will have to pass an exam, uh, uh, which we will be aware that they have passed. We can enter this to the database behind the mobile app, because uh, when there's, for example, a storm, we want to know how many people are trained to use chainsaws, for example, or work in, uh, at height. Uh, we will know that from the database, and we will have the uh, opportunity to issue uh, alerts uh, or deployment requests to only those with the qualifications or uh, with the alert we say that we are expecting people with these qualifications and then we can check. Uh, the verification uh, therefore is done through the uh, e-learning platform but when it comes to spontaneous volunteers I think it will be through the registration uh, uh, surface uh, which is probably web-based and I would have uh, uh, 10 questions or 20 questions at the very end, uh, so they would uh, be able to provide feedback. Okay. <clears throat> um, so there was maybe a quick answer. How do you ensure the um, um, actuality or, or the, the um, up-to-date, uh, that, that the data is up-to-date in the app or the application? Uh, in the mobile app, uh, the heads, it, of the, volunteer, uh, the heads of the volunteer units manage their own staff. 
So uh, it's their responsibility. It is their responsibility right now. It's just Excel sheet and uh, paper formats right now that they have to provide the uh, National Association of Firefighters, the Hungarian uh, Firefighters Association, with uh, uh, valid data because this is a, co a precondition for their insurance. The Hungarian Ministry of Interior uh, covers uh, volunteer firefighters uh, with the same insurance policy as it does the carrier firefighters. Uh, but the uh, condition for being part of this pool of uh, volunteer firefighters, insured volunteer firefighters, is to provide the uh, valid uh, uh, and up-to-date data. Okay, thanks. Um, and we have a couple of more questions. Um, I think um, we might have time for two more. Um, if one is going into the direction that um, the credential process and who is performing that, um, who's the the which which agency is responsible and and who's managing the volunteers? Is it just the firefighter organization, or is it uh, or are there other stakeholders as well who who? Um, I know in uh, neighboring countries, most neighboring countries, is the firefighters associations uh, organizing uh, the training courses and the examinations. In Hungary, we are uh, allowed to organize training courses uh, and uh, take part in the training, uh, the instructing of uh, new volunteers, uh, but the examinations are uh, held by a body of examiners uh, delegated uh, by the state agency, the Hungarian Disaster Management. Uh, directorate uh, in the uh, particular county uh, or one of the branch offices. Um, that's how it is done. So it is. It is. Uh, we have for uh, this is uh, for uh, the volunteer firefighter training uh, different stages, but the use of uh, equipment. Uh, we have a special blue book, uh, a small one, uh, which is identical to the carrier firefighters. And that, that those training courses are the exact same thing, and with the same uh, seals, stamps, uh, uh, same types, uh, for, even for sky lifts uh, and engines. Uh, that's why I made this uh, important distinction at the very beginning that I prefer the term carrier as opposed to professional for the paid uh, firefighters, the paid EMTs, and the uh, volunteer. Uh, would not mean a match a mature because these are the same exact uh, qualifications um, one last question then um, how do you address the problem of acceptance related to spontaneous forces among the, the trained or, or the professional first responders uh, could you rephrase that um, have you have you or have you experienced any um, issues in the acceptance of spontaneous volunteers, spontaneous forces, um, being that that the that the professional first responders are um, yeah offended or have problems to accept? I, I think that uh, this one is concerning the uh, uh, trained volunteers. Uh, spontaneous volunteers uh, can uh, enter certain uh, work zones; uh, they cannot even enter danger zones. Uh, uh, work zones they can enter uh, when they are needed and uh, uh, as much as they are needed for in case of floods but even during the flood there were zones uh, which only uh, carrier firefighters uh, and volunteer firefighters or not even volunteer firefighters were allowed for example Margaret Island was sealed off uh, I think it was the third or the fourth night when the, uh, the water levels were uh, reaching higher and higher and uh, only a few uh, uh, carry firefighters were allowed to stay there uh, yes uh, i i think i understand the question uh, the professional carrier uh, versus the volunteer uh, yes we had this uh, 10 15 years ago that okay this is my fire and that is yours uh, but do the citizens care who help i think i would personally be interested in the quickest help and not the biggest help yeah and i think that's a good closing word sebastian is on there so we we should hand over to the next speaker thank you Schalt. thanks for the question thank you thanks very much Schalt, and thanks very much christian it was very good to see this uh, 
just in time training example for volunteers. And now it's time back to Olga to introduce our last speaker. Yes. Um, hello. So it is my pleasure and the real one to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Benson. She is representing Inotis project, and I feel blessed and lucky to work with her. Uh, Elizabeth Benson is an inspector. Uh, is a, she's a British police officer currently serving as a head of performance and uh, development at the UK National Siberian Centre, part of UK counter-terrorism policy. She's a qualified Siberian commander, tactical advisor, responder, and radiation protection supervisor. Importantly, she is part of uh, a dedicated cadre of UK commanders providing support to Siberian incidents throughout the UK. Her portfolio includes being the exercise director for national Siberian exercises, leading on the development and delivery of Siberian continuous professional development and providing advice to UK government. Liz, the floor is yours. Do you hear me and do you see me, Olga? Uh, we hear you, but we cannot see you yet. Okay. And can you now see me? Good morning. Now it's perfect. Okay, and now I share my screen. And is that acceptable? Yes. Okay, well, good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction, Olga. Um, I will start and uh, excuse me, I will read from notes. Uh, I want to talk to you today about a new form of just in time training. Uh, how to maintain response in a time of crisis by taking face-to-face -face training online. I'd like to tell you the definition of crisis. Uh, it's from the early 15th century. And a crisis is a decisive point in the progress of a disease. It's also a point at which change must come, for better or for worse. So, This is the UK National CBRN Centre with office, classroom, training village and accommodation. A CBRN event in the UK is a terrorism incident involving a chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear agent, sometimes in conjunction with an explosive device. When CBRN, just in time training, went online, we had to understand what is lost when unable to do this established practice face to face. Is it the loss of the nonverbal communication or reduced confidence in the delegate by not having the opportunity to reach out and ask questions or clarify a point? Or for training on a practical procedure, the loss of the structure, usually balanced with the theory that reinforces the learning and assures us as assessors that delegates are competent in dangerous or critical safe, safe systems of working practice. Today, I'm going to explain some ways the UK Counterterrorism National CBRN Centre transformed its educational structure to develop concurrent, just in time training and critical function training at REACH during a crisis. First, let me tell you more about the UK National CBRN Centre. We bring together the emergency services to protect and prepare the UK against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threat. We are part of counter-terrorism facing. We support the emergency services with 24-7 specialist advice. We strengthen the local and national response to a CBRN incident. And we assure and develop CBRN expertise in the UK and abroad. Chief officers from the police, fire and ambulance services lead the centre's strategy in partnership with counter-terrorism facing, military and government. We recognise our best response to the CBRN threat must be through a united effort with expertise drawn from the emergency services and beyond. The threat landscape is varied and sometimes rapid change can come fast. Whilst we must maintain strategic focus and manage longer term projects, we also are reactive to changes in trends and technology. We work with partners to support and strengthen capability to reduce vulnerability and ensure we, as the UK emergency services, are prepared. At the end of March 2020, due to the pandemic, our training centre paused its business as usual. 
we entered into a space where the priority was to look at critical training, recognize new training, which had to be established to respond to the pandemic and use new ways of working. We needed to keep pace with the national requirements to assure capability during and after the crisis. Today, my aim is to give examples of critical and just-in-time training and elaborate on how this was achieved during a crisis. How we plan, collaborate and deliver. In crisis management, the event can bring together stakeholders and organisations who have no legacy of working together. Here, the situation, task, action and result need a principle which is universally effective. We use a model and system which is accessible and wide reaching. A model we use day in and day out, uh, which is agile. And when it came to the new just-in-time training, it can be as relevant to business, industry or partner organisations as it is the emergency services. The methodology I want to share and explain is the Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Principles. We call it JESSIP. In the UK, JESSIP is accepted and established practice for CBRN events. The Joint Operating Principles and Doctrine enhance the delivery of initial and specialist operational response. When our strategic direction came that certain counter-terrorism CBRN training must continue, it was imperative for the National CBRN Centre to use the principal and joint decision-making model to deliver this critical training at pace and online. This diagram is the joint decision-making wheel, and I'm sure many of you are familiar or have a similar concept. This is more conventionally used as an incident scene or dynamically by commanders, not really to deliver training. The demand for counter-terror CBRN training to run concurrently alongside a pandemic crisis gave an opportunity to recognise this methodology for just-in-time training. Here on the inside of the wheel, you'll see it emerges. First, we start with the uh, training needs analysis. What emergency services do well, and we all know this, is operating situations of danger and risk. We do this by having safe systems of work, consistent commanders and incredibly good training. The National CBRN Centre undertook a training needs analysis and fast tracked the prioritisation of training through the relevant governance structure. Once the key training objectives were agreed, it was the team's moment to turn their face-to-face -face training into a blended online and in-person product. The training needs analysis identified certain priority training. I'm going to explain how a two-day residential training course for a critical response capability moved online without reducing the content, tactical sensitivity or quality of teaching. Here, our key considerations were the tight time frame and how to complement the arrival of some personal protective equipment that the training was designed for. We had the need to comply with social distancing and lockdown restrictions uh, as far as was possible. We needed assurance that the full training would be delivered and ensure that the delegates were immediately deployable upon completion. And finally, confidence that the delegates would learn effectively using online training platforms. This was arguably the most ambitious part of the just-in-time training. As the world embraced Zoom or Microsoft Teams, the effort here was to find a consistent delivery platform across multiple IT systems uh, across the UK. Options identified. A framework was designed to assist the team in evaluating the required criteria to select and develop the right online platform. Here, the chosen platform needed to perform against not only the training aims and objectives, but also against the legal assurance and policy stipulations. In other realms, online training is well used and an accepted methodology. 
and whilst always considered by us, it has been resisted for certain tactical training. Here, the joint decision-making model adds the contingencies in blue. A plan B must never be underestimated. Having the requirement to evidence the contingency is reassuring to all stakeholders. When the user requirements were met, the team worked with subject matter experts to ensure there was no dilution in content. As critical friends, we all assisted in taking part in a dry run practice. We used different devices, connectivity and audio equipment. The feedback was used to improve the joining instructions, delivery and content. Course face-to-face -face delivery. I am not going to explain the measures taken to provide safe face-to-face -face training. Suffice to say, we have all learned a lot about administration, logistics, and how small our classrooms are. A two-day program was created. The online piece was the first day to allow reflective learning and consolidation to be in person on the second day. So here is what happened. Day one, and we're online. Part one, a test webinar took place to ensure that all delegates could use all the functions of the platform. All delegates took part. Then there was a break, which allowed for IT alterations. Then part two, the full training session. This online training was live, interactive, made use of a chat forum, questions requiring individual response, learning video, uh, and a plenary session. Day two, and the team who had received the training on day one came to our center. As low as reasonably practicable face-to-face -face training, used for certain tactical options, pertinent information, and confirmation of online learning. Results and review, feedback and lessons learned. The first course returned three notable actions, which were used to spin the wheel of the joint decision-making model. These actions were the new information that improved the learning within the just-in-time training. A point to note here is that the delivery of this training could not be 100% online. Certain information was delivered within the face-to-face -face training. There can be no lower trainer delegate interaction with online training. Remember, online does not appeal to all types of learners. Delegates can be distracted when the trainer is unable to hold a room uh, and or engage with all participants. Here, the use of individual online participation and reward were a success. The trainers used a blend of poll, survey, and emoji to stimulate and gratify the delegate. That concludes my example of how the model underpinned design and delivery of the online training. A concrete example of just-in-time training in the UK is the pandemic multi-agency response teams. Here, teams were trained to respond to suspected COVID-19 deaths in non-medical locations in key cities in England. The specialist teams comprise of police officers, firefighters and health service staff. The key objectives are to confirm life extinct, establish no suspicious circumstances and assist with the removal, burial or cremation services and support the families of the deceased. The joint decision model was used for the training and delivery of pandemic multi-agency response teams. The situation needed skilled and resilient professionals with the correct legal powers and equipment, with the right transport and PPE to deal efficiently with the task. Training was delivered remotely using a novel presentation which delivered standard operating procedures 
and pictorial direction for personal protective equipment and safe undressing procedure. The strategic direction to keep the balance between learning online and in person was defined as keeping all in-person training as low as reasonably practicable. This meant skills and drills were at reach and personal interaction was used to promote the much needed responder resilience side to this task. The new teams of mixed discipline needed to trust each other for confidence and support during a difficult and emotive task. This blended learning was captured and as the concept became a reality, the learning was shared and improvements were made to the procedures. My final opportunity here is to tell you about how the UK Counter-Terror Police Network is capturing the learning which has arisen throughout this crisis. Like all aspects of policing, we've had to adapt at pace to meet the challenges created by the pandemic. This includes adapting to new ways of working, be that remotely or by applying social distancing rules in the workplace. Despite these challenges, counter-terror policing has maintained pre-COVID levels of operational capability. And our nationwide capacity is consistently monitored to ensure the best possible protection against terrorist threat. Taking the time and energy to capture real-time learning whilst dealing with a pandemic is a challenge worth taking up. The value in sharing best practice comes when it saves lives or another person or department, time or resource. For the counter-terror network in the UK, the pandemic has given rise to manifold risk-based decision-making. Decisions which have been easier with the joint decision model and the joint understanding of risk through partner agencies. And here are my key takeaways. For online just-in-time training, virtual co-locating for training as mixed disciplines makes the communicating and coordinating a part of the responders' joint understanding of risk. Real-time learning must be fast-tracked through any governance structure and shared widely and in fast time. Have the trainer visible through as much training as possible and at least at the start and end. It is a very good piece for engagement and confidence. Online joining instructions need to be as good, if not more so, than the traditional face-to-face -face instructions for attendance. Natural disasters, terrorist events and public health emergencies will benefit and always have from just-in-time training. A key recommendation is to have the mechanism and understanding to make just-in-time training a key consideration to mitigate the harm and loss. When a situation requires a rapid change, the decisions made, rationale behind them, they need to be recorded. This is a key principle of Jessup. Uh, I've just seen it in a previous presentation. I cannot uh, advocate it enough. Capturing just-in-time training through online delivery allows responders the opportunity to revisit the delivery and having a repository to store relevant just-in-time training is well worth considering. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. It was very interesting, very inspiring presentation. So, thank you. Uh, uh, you have a couple of questions. How many people have been trained through uh, online just-in-time training? From our center, I think we've now done, we're on our fourth cohort um, of operating with those training principles. Slowly, we will be returning to the new normal uh, and the regulations are changing rapidly, but I think that blended learning will now stay with us. Um, so, as people have said, as devastating as the pandemic is, it has pushed us to really look at the application of uh, online platform for just-in-time training. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Are there any considerations taken into account regarding security of online training events about who is participating, watching, learning, taking into account that such trainings may be put in place for terrorism-related incidents? Thank you. Somebody was paying attention there. I used cautious words because I work for the counter-terror network, but yes, that is why not all our training can be online. We have uh, parts which will always be um, closed within the network. What is on the online platform, we monitor by having uh, email addresses that we identify as being secure email addresses. Uh, that's how we operate. There is the element of trust because that is our moral code of ethics, but also people sign in so we know who has done the training. Okay, thank you. Next question. How do you ensure that participants have relevant background knowledge about the subject? And secondly, how do you ensure that the participant is the person he or she says they are? Again, we had this discussion because for us, the online platform is something we had looked at and we had chosen not to do. So that was one of our concerns. It's a matter of personal integrity and it did base on um, the email account which is assigned to the professional. So that was the starting point uh, there. And then when they attend on the second day, they sign for their first day. And that's how we have balanced that out. And the question about do they have the skills, just in the previous presentation, Yes, we have a national framework so we can see what skills people have so we are not inappropriately training. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Do, do you train people from different countries? Yes. Um, please, my details are here. I mostly deal with the um, incoming and outgoing uh, conversations to do with uh, that, with our training department. But yes, we very much have it as part of our CBRN action plan going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Do you consider decontamination a topic that can be part of just in-time training or something that can only be taught in face-to-face -face training? I think it's not something we have covered, but I would be confident that just in time training online, um, as long as it was done with a shared situational awareness between all participants and that the joint understanding of risk was carefully delivered and discussed, we could do that online as multi agencies. Uh, obviously, there are some parts of decontamination which are very contextual. Uh, and that's where it comes to how we are much more comfortable at doing just-in-time training, often um, standing together where we can interact and sometimes role play through a situation. But I can see this advancing as we go forward. So decontamination would, for me, it would not cause a, an issue. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, who are the targets in this COVID case for online training? Firefighters, health services or who? Yes. Um, sorry, can you just repeat the start there, Olga? Okay, I rephrase a little bit. Uh, so what type of disciplines of first responders are the audience of this online training in this COVID-19 case? Ah. Thank you. So the online training that I first talked about and talked through about the day one and the day two, that's uh, police delegates and that's a police only uh, tactic and operational part. Um, the um, pandemic multi-agency, as I said, that's um, a blended amount of specialists to have the right powers and capability to deal with the aims and objectives. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and probably we have time for the last question. That was a general question for, for all, but I think you are exactly the right person to reply. Is there a legal framework for just-in-time training and how the evaluation of just-in-time training is made or managed? For us, our policy, doctrine, guidance in CBRN is largely um, overseen by our strategic leads and governance. We have the Office for Security of Counterterrorism within the Home Office Government Department, and that's who I provide assurance to. So when we do just-in-time training, we really, really use our subject matter experts to critically look at what we're looking to deliver. And then it is for us to have the assurance um, and the recording of it as well, um, to go to the policymakers or the procedures and, and explain what we've adapted and how, and that's how we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Yes, thank you very much, Liz. It was really, really knowledgeable, very insightful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So I guess we can conclude now our presentation. I would like to... Um, uh, yes, okay. I have to apparently scroll to my slides. To the very end, uh, to thank all the presenters, all the speakers today. It was very interesting, and uh, I think I hope it was really inspiring, very interesting for all our guests. The discussions were excellent. Thank you for all your questions uh, and your presence, your attendance. So, for your information, all presentations will be available for download on the website where you registered for this webinar. Uh, so on the uh, www.practitionersnetworks.eu in the presentations part and the full record of this webinar will be also available uh, there in the images so you will you will see it all for somebody who lost sound at some point or lost image so you will have access to everything and as the main outcome of this webinar uh, our five projects uh, will produce a white paper with a webinar summary, key challenges, uh, some summarized topics and discussions from all the three speakers, conclusions and recommendations. Of course, uh, it will take us some time to prepare this, um, probably around one month or so, but all the participants will receive this white paper, of course, when it is ready. So we would like to thank you very much again. Uh, hope you are with us now for all our further events and don't hesitate to contact uh, the relevant network of practitioners uh, relevant to your field of expertise, to your interest, and we are always happy to receive you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. <laughs>